welcome. We have Mohammed and Jan, who also goes by Michael and myself, Michael. And we have a bunch of random topics to discuss, but we were talking about a, a, a pressing topic, which is sort of why are we not using Linux? And Jan, you had some insights you were getting into. So could you tell us more about that and perhaps even introduce yourself? Right, so I'm Jan, I'm a software architect for like a past couple of years. Uh, in previous work, we basically use FreeBSD uh, almost exclusively, except for some like uh, Linux-ish or Kubernetes-ish stuff. Uh, and we are running on basically uh, really microservice-centric or container-centric workflows. Uh, so that might be curious because obviously we should go for Linux, right? Because hey, containers. But uh, one reason why we use FreeBSD or I choose to use FreeBSD uh, on cloud and container is because of DJs. So basically, uh, you can refer to my other talk in IBSD can or UBSD can, but uh, basically on FreeBSD, because GL is a primitive, it allows you to detrace exactly what happened in that container and, how, and kind of how you interact with the rest of the system. So that means in instant you gain a lot of like uh, observability benefit without if doing a lot, even with like a bunch of junior junior -er developers, uh, just simply as you can detrace from what in Solaris we, we call the global zone. And they can kind of just trace like the container and know exactly what's happening inside. And with a, a little bit of effort, you can even like uh, trace the, um, events in like a uh, scale for clusters because you can kind of like uh, match between like the time offset and all kind of stuff and you kind of know what exactly happening and how uh, your microservices interact with each other. Now, technically you can use things like open telemetry or just use a lot of logs to figure these kind of things out, but it's very nice to have DJs that, you know, when your production system is not running correctly, you can still go inside and try to debug the system without actually shutting down everything. So that is a prime reason why uh, personally I'm working on projects that actually uh, builds like container on FreeBSD, but in a way that uh, it's almost like throwaway containers instead of like a more persistent uh, virtual host like traditional gels. Very cool. And I'm curious, you know, if the grass is greener on the other side, what have you heard about BPF trace as a Linux tracing tool? Is it caught up? It's great. I mean, I think BPF trace has a lot of potential, uh, especially like Brenda is working on it, obviously. But there's like, I'm not sure how if how far does it go right now on Linux size, but the fact that there's no such thing as container as a primitive on the Linux side means you cannot just trivially trace things happening in quote unquote this container because your container technically does not exist in the eye of the kernel. So uh, again, I, I'm not exactly sure how far it goes right now uh, on the Linux side. Maybe they invented some primitive, probably not. Uh, but in all the trace events happening using EPPF on the Linux side, you still kind of need to follow everything in your container, like, okay, what are all the processes in this container or in the C groups and kind of try to trace them individually. Mm -hmm. But on FreeBSD, it's more like, I have a jail. I want to trace things in a jail and you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, obviously yeah. that's th that is not totally true for all kinds of events. For example, like the, if you want to trace things like uh, the network stack in the kernel, but it's still much easier. Uh, than Linux, as, as far as I know right now. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, Mohammed, do you have any thoughts on that? Why, why we aren't using Linux? Because hey, the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, no, I cannot get as deep as uh, what Jan explained. I'm actually using Linux in in my daily job, uh, specifically with uh, AWS ECS, but. Um, I still believe that the technology in BSD world is much better and much well hardened, and that's why I joined the call to learn more about it. And hopefully, one time I can move our infrastructure to BSD. Yeah, 
but we're not there yet, to be honest. Um, what stands out in BSD and FreeBSD and Lumos for you? Uh, well, at least from what I noticed, like specifically when when the when how did the, the Linux containers start to spread out? It's it's mainly from developer perspective, not maybe from the sysadmin perspective. I think it, co it coincided with the, uh, the, 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 the new trends of microservices and that how you can just package everything in one package, just the container image and basically off you go. But as you can see, there, uh, there's a lot of it challenges still when it comes to security and they're still kind of like learning how to solve these things along the way. And at least from my readings, I cannot say from practical experience that given the, the how old the technology on FreeBSD is, and I'm saying this in a positive way, that it's well hardened, and, and I think a lot of these chains are already solved there. That's that's why I'm interested into this. Understood, and I suppose I should go. Um, I first sat down at 4.3 BSD, perhaps in 91, and there's just a certain simplicity that that makes sense and only changes when it has to change. Um, I'll try to take notes as I do that. Uh, fundamental simplicity. And so I've, I've used the same muscle memory on things for decades. And I don't see why you need to change things for the sake of change and uh, I, in practice, case, I'm, uh, that only gets better. I was burned by RPM hell. And if you've watched any of my talks, I often touch on that. And so uh, that brought me to jail. And then the moment, I think it was 5.1 introduced the J tools with J exec and JLS. It's like, well, I can try some LAMP stack and install it and delete it and move on rather than pretty much have to reinstall the entire OS. And then along came ZFS and I used that on Mac and FreeBSD for over a decade. And I've got a lab with like NetBSD and I was the first one to use it on Windows hardware and then came Beehive. And so between those, um, I think what has, almost brought me back despite being like point blank to it, but uh, the Occam BSD project of mine has let me use build options to cut it down to the bare minimum and work my way back. And that is just so refreshing given that a project of 20 some or 30 years history is burdened by lots of documentation of various quality and components that are somewhat forgotten about and all that will cut it down clean up what's there and it, it just nothing else does that in theory one could do uh linux from scratch or yocto project and have a bare minimum linux but okay as you work your way up you you do get kvm which is a very capable hypervisor i will grant them that and i find it useful under proxmox for even FreeBSD work but uh zfs won't be a first class client and containers as exactly clarified are not yet a kernel primitive they're they're getting there but hey how many decades of getting there and uh, i'm quite excited about what oxide is doing with alumos and omni os because we need alternatives we can't have a multi monoculture and all the many of these great technologies in freebsd come from aluma so uh it's all good so I was hoping Andrew could join who's using um, OmniOS in production. He's a, re a regular, but that's okay. You can, you can definitely hear his opinions on the previous calls. So that said, um, I don't know if any of you care about if I move this meeting, I'll try to get a bigger consensus on that. Maybe move it a little hour, hour later. The developers, primarily John and Patrick, are pretty tied up with specific tasks such that 
I'm thinking the developer calls will maybe take a hiatus, but I proposed a, an open ZFS call, production users call on the last leadership meeting and Matt was positive. So maybe the slot next week will be filled with that. Are either of you using ZFS? It's a loaded question. Anyway, um, and from there, I suppose with at least the three of us, are there any near complete components for FreeBSD 14? Because we've been once again blessed by OpenSSL pushing the release date back. And so especially Jan, if you've been following along, is there anything that stands out that you, you know is close to completion, but just not quite there yet? Uh, beehive that. specific or like oh, in general no this is this is all good it's all good right so i have a new patch for route that uh use gel uh i have an other one other review that has some people reviewing but i'm not sure if it's going to land is that i added like a per gel uh api format uh syscontrol and basically that means you can limit the binaries in a jail to default fall back to like a, say a Linux API or something like that. Uh, I try to see if I can. Yeah, I can post those yeah. to you. Yeah, uh, one house will try to have to your links ready, that. but that's cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I try to get that land on 14 because that would mean that if you create a Linux jail, you don't have to change the host for a bad elf brand. Uh, uh, you can just like change it per gel and that okay. should make uh, Linux gel easier because um, sometimes if you don't want to change the host one, you, you might need to hunt down the binaries and then run uh, run your elf on each one of them. But this just allowed the kernel to do the job for you and without changing the actual Linux binary. Uh, the other one is just teaching Rao to attach and run itself in a gel such that uh, this is uh, I'd get uh, the comment from a previous patch for if config, and someone asked me if I can add that to route as well. So I'm adding that to route. Okay. And that was all a hot topic from yesterday's call. And I'll even just take a peek there. So we concluded we should inventory what utilities are jail aware if initially from a documentation perspective, but also for, well, what perhaps should sprout. Ah, would this specifically be it? <laughs> Not if config yeah, and route so. coming. Okay. I so think yeah, if copy already land in in uh yeah, I think I think if config already committed. Okay. Uh, route I just added today and uh, I need to adjust something and maybe other sender can commit it later. Okay. Is the second one of these for uh, route? Yep. Great. Let me link it there just because that was the topic yesterday. So let's review. Oh, cool. Yo, this is, you come to the right place. Uh, let's take a peek at these. Is there anything blocking these from a reviewing perspective? Or wh whose court uh -huh. is the ball in, <laughs> as they say? I think I said that it's being pretty uh, supportive. I mean, I just need to do some changes. I think the route can commit maybe in one or two days, but the API brand maybe is, is sort of a niche topic. Uh, when people uh, reviewed it, they seems okay with it, but uh, I don't think, I think it's kind of stuck there right now. Um, okay. Yeah, but essentially what it does, it just change the uh, L4 back per jail, but, and then uh, James also mentioned that, hold on a second, we have three syscontrol and one of them is a deprecated one. Well, it's, it's the one for compatibility reason. And then can we just use that to reflect the uh, elf brand per prism? So I add an other review that, so you can see it's linking an other review that is uh, related to that, that is about changing the syscontrol, but uh, yeah. Um, have you addressed all of Jamie's feedback? Yeah, the Jamie's feedback is really different. They serve a separate patch, and that's why that's like a, a trial revision okay. about the uh, syscontrol part of it.
Okay, nice. And let's take a look at this one. And then route support, dash J flag. Yes, yeah. that's exactly the conversation. Um, is Jamie listed? Look, Zoom is covering that part of the screen. Uh, you may want to subscribe Jamie on that one. Okay. I see he's on the previous one, but not this one. And uh, ba, 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 ba. looks good to me. Well, yeah, go ahead and add him as a reviewer, and maybe that's pretty straightforward. If so far it's like, well, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, great work. Uh, that was route uh, a would it be a bi fallback um and then if i can type yeah feel free to i guess add him and nudge him on both of those and say hey we discussed it on you know this call and see what he thinks if they seem very straightforward, they seem like def definite uh, progress. And the hot topic over on that call has been the uh, dot include support. So how to handle configuration file includes because Goran's approach with sourcing multiple config files was a bit more complicated than it had to be. So Jamie just thought, thought about it and came back with his proposal and everyone's pretty happy with it. So. Perhaps that's on your radar. Um, and here is that review, if you're wondering. I'll just drop it in the chat for you. So this was the result of, I'd argue, two months of these calls. Like, OK, we have a giant proposal. It's a bit more complicated than it should be. Then let's discuss it as a group. Let's find a more elegant approach. And there it is. So. Feel free to take a look at that and test it if you have a moment. Mm -hmm. But simple things like that. I mean, uh, from the very first call uh, for jails, it was like, hey, why don't we have any notion of a state machine? The jail command takes in parameters, builds up commands, and throws them all out. It's like, well, what if we kept on to some of that just so we know how we got here? Um, and then Antronig banged out a... Lua, F Lua based UCL aware jail front end because once uh, that we collectively had a basic understanding of the jail API and syscalls, well, he just cranked out a, a, a front end and hopefully it can be well enough documented and uh, easy to use that people aren't reinventing the wheel all the time. I'm sure we've everyone here present has written their own like jail manager as a rite of passage. <laughs> so anyway. Oh um, yeah, that's how many, is it over 10 jail managers out there at least? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and so hopefully things, just elegant little strategic things like the includes, like your that, that's exactly, <laughs> I mean, I can't emphasize enough. This was a discussion yesterday. The, things like the route command, how, how uh, institutionalized is jail? Well, actually it's quite institutionalized and in prepare for my, preparation for my recent talks, I did audits of, well, what supports LiveXO and base? And it was a lot more than were documented and what supports UCL and it's a few things. And so that's going full circle to the advantages of something like FreeBSD. You can make changes that reach the entire OS rather than dealing with projects around the world who are technically completely decoupled. And hopefully you can persuade the new route to incorporate something in the kernel, et cetera, unless your name is Red Hat, and then you can probably strong arm everybody. And anyway, that's that that keeps me here. <laughs> so um Jan, while we have you, do you have any wish list items? Any just, wow, what if FreeBSD and Illumos and or can do this and it's been nagging you on a 
sort of a higher level than one command getting a J flag. Oof. I <laughs> think the things I want are more low level ones. Okay. Well, br uh, uh, bring them on. I mean, I love to have, uh, I think it has been mentioned in Dev Summit as well, uh, overlay FS and especially uh, overlay FS that can sort of kind of automatically understand the, uh, the OCI, uh, uh, the OCI, uh, what do they call it? They call it the diff, uh, the file system diff mm -hmm. uh, format, uh, because that is quite essential for like a fully functional uh, OCI-ish container ecosystem. Uh, I know they probably have some people working on it, uh, working on overlay FS. So we will see uh, how it goes. I think in Dev Summit, it says that it's maybe playable 15 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be nice. Um, yeah. And so far, that's the only one on my radar. Maybe, yeah, I don't think that's much else left. Interesting. I like the phrase left because, yeah, so much progress has been made. But I, are you doing what most do, which is rip out each level, splat it out to ZFS, and then snapshot it? And just sort of step you through it. You kind of have to do that without yeah. the overlay FS, but I kind of do it in a way that's a bit different. Oh, um, do you tell? I have my own challenges. Um, the the problem is that uh, when I design my utilities, it's about to utilize what ex already exists on OCI, but you know, just just pick something to follow and something not to follow. So I need to kind of find a way to make sure. Uh, I can generate this file system divs and then like also uploading them to like an OCI repository. So the progress I have right now is that I can upload a FreeBSD container to an OCI registry, let's say uh, Amazon ECL or like R3 uh, a registry. And then on a separate machine, I can just pull the containers and use them directly. Mm -hmm. And I can also just pull Linux containers from Docker Hub and use them directly. What's the name so, of the Amazon uh, one you mentioned? Uh, ECR, I believe. UCL or uh, oh, ECR. Yeah. Elastic Container Registry. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if there's something I do want to change, um, I have a talk to Mark a little bit, uh, Mark J a little bit uh, during Dev Summit mm -hmm. in the Hack Launch that we actually need to figure out some other way to do uh, DevFS uh, because DevFS, I, I kind of figured like a solution for the def, dynamic DevFS rules, but it's probably worth note that there's something you probably need to do in, on the kernel side to have a more modern uh, DevFS uh, structure. Uh, the, current, the current way I deal with DevFS is simply that the container can uh, have a fragment of the DevFS rules they required, and that would automatically depends on the permission model. It automatically generate a new DevFS rules and number and attach to the jail. But you know that is kind of hacky-ish. Uh, technically, ideally, if there's like a better, a more modern way to deal with DevFS, that would be great uh, because it also has to do with. Um, Name collusion, all of all of that, because you know DevFS is not technically jail aware. Um, so you have weird things like tap devices need to show up in both like the host and the jail, uh, and you and they cannot have the same name. So if the jail does not know that def uh, that tap device already created, it will try to create it, it cannot create it. Uh, because you cannot see it and all kind of weird stuff. Same thing for now modem, uh, NMDM, uh, for Beehive. So yeah, I think that is like a big issue that we might have to somehow solve. Is it solved elsewhere, be it Illumos or Linux I, or something else? Or I don't no know, problem? but I think it's a two-step thing. Um, First of all, like really the tap device logic may be a bit wrong mm. because that's 
you know, uh, what are the reasons why you actually need to have like a dev tab uh, device? It's probably just for like a uh, process able to open it, but maybe there's are some other approach that we can deal with it without actually have to use uh, the dev tab X devices. Um, but that does not totally solve the whole issue because there's something that's not uh, networks that related. For example, NMDM, like how do you want to deal with it? So I'm not sure how it's done elsewhere, but uh, yeah, it, it is a, it is not an easy problem to solve. Understood. But hey, at least the conversation is in motion and planting seeds is very, very important. Yeah, the worst part is if we, if we are able to solve it, it might mean we actually have to break something. Hmm. Uh, so how do we solve it while have some kind of backward compatibility is a hard problem. Understood. And somehow if I type double E, I get like a long E. What's going on? <laughs> so if you're following along in the minutes, it's kind of bonkers. Um, I have a newbie question. Please. Uh, because both in this call and the James one, um, I think I'm subscribed to all the required mailing lists, but I don't see any enough traffic that I could follow like the certain topics discussed in the call. Is, is there another place where such topics are discussed outside the call? Is there like a wiki space or an, another mailing list that is not listed or IRC, for example? So IRC is one of them, but it's also one of seemingly a dozen places to discuss such topics. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Discord is getting attention. And I personally am limited on my mental bandwidth of how many things to follow. Mm -hmm. So I guess find what works best for you. Um, okay. uh, I, yeah, and that's part of the reason I, I think a call is valuable insofar as it's synchronous mm -hmm. and focused rather than that the countless fraction mm -hmm. conversations on IRC where either you see the question or the answer, but often not both, which is mm -hmm. very frustrating. Uh, but it's a valid question. Jan, do you have any favorites? Uh, favorite about what? For chatting, discussing IRC, Discord, uh, Slack. I don't have a preference, but I think there are some effort to make a FreeBSD matrix server. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So add another one to the list. <laughs> like, okay. And is there a good phone app? And does it have history of the conversation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I've personally found that all frustrating, but only for like two decades. So, and then I have various conversations in Skype simply because it's got sort of pervasive mm -hmm. reach and people have had it and the history is good enough for some searching. So it's it's a challenge. Um, yeah, and to be honest, a lot of the things happen kind of in between conferences. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. So Absolutely. most most of, I think most of the, uh, I think a lot of the conversation happen in the hallway. Oh, no mm -hmm. question. Between the conference, so. But if that was you and Mark talking DevFS and you then sort of formalize it here or in we a talk kind of, or we don't we don't talk in deep, we kind of just reckon that the issue is there. Uh, it's not like we have any. It's just like maybe thirty sec in thirty seconds we have mentioned about it. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm not the one hating the DevFS uh, subsystem. Mm -hmm. Um. How are you managing Beehive VMs, if I may? Uh, I have my own, so uh, that's. You want to talk weird. about that? Um, yeah, just like uh, it's a Rust uh, supervisor, basically just uh, supervise a Beehive process, so it can actually do uh, this structure and it can do a bunch of things. Uh, in fact, it can tell you that it failed because you you're missing a uh, tab device or things like that. So that's kind of helpful for my own use case. Is it technically um, a state machine? I don't think so. I think it's more like the first stage is like taking a JSON and then pass it 
And then the second stage is really just checking if all the things you can check are satisfied. For example, okay, you're trying to pass a disk to the Beehive. Is a disk actually ex exists? Uh, is the tab interface actually created? Uh, or if NMDM is actually loaded, things like that. Uh, okay. And in the, and the end of the day, it just launched the Beehive command and then check the exit code if it has to restart and things like that. So it's not really, a, it's, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's just normal. So. And is it in, is it public in any way yet? Uh, it is sort of, but I haven't updated for a really long time. So I can probably- Can you shoot a link in there and hey, why not? Yeah, sure, I can. Cool. Oh, by the way, if you know someone for Illumos, maybe you can help check the, um, there's a PR I open with uh, Offsite that bring the uh, interface um, for adding uh, D-Trace uh, USDT pops uh, to a Rust program that's still open. But that is kind of like really off topic. It's all on topic. So it's D-Trace probes for Rust, because I know they're all over mobile. Uh, it's, it's, it's that you can add your custom D-Trace probes uh, in your Rust uh, binary kind of thing. Uh, it has been open for almost a year now. And I think the outside people also being really helpful, but I think everyone just kind of forget about it. Uh, yeah. So that's the USDT Pope's one. That is kind of the thing that would be really helpful for me, because I write most of my new utilities in Rust, and I love to be able to detrace against them. Right? Uh, that's a, that's also that's also the main reason why I use FreeBSD on cloud and mm -hmm. uh, for containers and all that. Um, that said, do you have any favorite detrace one-liners? I was thinking for the I use DWatch. Um, oh, okay. So DWatch yep. is pretty good, uh, especially for in the, in the gel use case. DWatch kind of can uh, the the organic D trace command does not have a best J or like okay, I want to trace against this gel flat, but it exists in DWatch, and the output for of uh, DWatch is just like uh, much nicer. Uh, yeah, so indeed, it saves me a lot of time to actually writing a D trace script. Got it. Cool. Well, I'm guessing people are tied up with end of the month, start of the month, graduations, post conference, you name it. But this has been very helpful. And especially towards the end of a conversation, all topics are fair game. As Mohammed can confirm, yesterday we covered a lot of territory on just community issues and community management, especially in small countries. Um, yep. do, 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 do. Well, if you have anything else you want to bring up, I'm 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 all in, or we can just uh, push to next time. Uh, Jan, do I have I you on so the far. invite list? Have I been good about uh, that? I that's an invite list. Yeah. Did you get? I just have an informal announcement. If you aren't receiving those, shoot me an an address in chat, and I'll add you to it. Yeah. Sure. Like an email address. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Just whatever's right. suitable for such things. Thank you. And is that related to the cat? Uh, I'm no. Well, I refuse to uh, acknowledge or deny about it. Okay, that's just fine. Yeah. And what was your favorite part of BSD Can while I've got you? Uh, I guess that that's something is uh, in a uh, pretty good in general. Uh, I like the firecracker talks. Uh, that is 
really cool. Colin's work. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed, have you heard of Firecracker? Yes, of course. Great. Oh yeah, you're in that you're in that ecosystem. Um, what distinguishes it for those of us who are not using it? Uh, so because in my past days, obviously I run my things on AWS, right? So essentially a faster boot time on Firecracker means when I create an EC2 instance mm. and then I start to use it, uh, the delay is just shortened by a whole lot. It also relates to performance uh, for FreeBSD on like um, EC2 in general, although like, um, yeah, so you are on like the native hypervisor. So if you can support Firecracker then, or if we have like better performance of Firecracker, that means a lot in terms of like uh, using FreeBSD in production on EC2. Uh, there's some other reason why the Firecracker, uh, especially boot up time, uh, interests me is because um, there's also, there's an other advantage of FreeBSD container that does not exist on Linux, is that uh, we can actually have a jails root on NFS. Uh -huh. That is, you cannot really do that on Linux, but it's okay on FreeBSD. So one of the usage, uh, or one of the trick I always, always use is that, um, because we can always create like a file system for a like, for container somewhere on a not so big server and then export it uh, via NFS. And when I have to have some, um, really dynamic uh, computational requirement. For example, like suddenly I need to transcode like an hour long video. Mm -hmm. I can just use the AWS API to spin up, uh, say 96 coil gigantic uh, instance. And that instance, that FreeBSD instance just mounts the uh, NFS file system to its own, uh, let's say uh, slash mount, and then just run the container directly without pulling the container uh, image like on Linux at all. And you, it basically just run hmm. um, with very, fairly low latency because Colin does such a great job um, for FreeBSD on AWS. But a faster boot time for FreeBSD means that process, that delay between me spinning up the FreeBSD, that means me calling the API to create the AWS instance and when that instance actually start to do real work, gets shortened by a lot. Uh, it's, it's, so it's really nice to see that uh, happen because the whole point of having it not need to pull, let's say, um, a Docker container if we're running on Linux, right? Is that to pull the Docker containers to your machine on cloud, it still take time, mm -hmm. but mounting an NFS and just use it directly is much faster. And having a faster boot time for FreeBSD on Amazon or AWS, it means um, the latency is, is even shorter. So that's, that's something I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Those are very good points. And Funny, that's kind of yeah, what the whole we, we probably is need about, to, right? Uh, that was the whole promise. Yeah, we we'll probably that, need oh. to add the NFS part to the benefit why we use FreeBSD on cloud. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's actually really cool that, you know, you can literally have like a headless or thisless, uh, sorry, not headless, but <laughs> like a thisless system. Yeah. And just as your computer to run things, you don't have to store a copy of like, the image uh, on every instance. Uh, and that is extremely helpful uh, or cost efficient even. So but basically just yeah. containers in the form of jails. Yeah, because you can, you can just mount it over NFS and it just works. Yeah. Have you just, played so, with Occam BSD at all? No, I haven't. So that's my little project to cut down the OS using build options to the bare minimum, first bare minimum to boot, build it, then boot it, and then add mm -hmm. fancy features like networking. And so oh, cool. uh, my machine at 
BSD can was in, in fact running Proxmox, I could build the OS under FreeBSD, under KVM hypervisor in six minutes. And then I bare metal booted on my little Samsung external drive for FreeBSD. And it built in three minutes on a Ryzen laptop, new toy. So oh, cool. on a super proper machine, uh, you know, an Epic server, whatever, we're down to just you know a minute or two for building the OS and then booting naturally is just a few seconds. And that's where Colin's work is spectacular. And I think I've even built in his little TS log or whatever hooks that if you really want to get scientific, you can flame graph your two second boot. So um, I will shoot you a link to that. Mm -hmm. uh, get uh, oh, auto completed. So yeah, I've spent some time there. Here is that because that's that you, you nailed it. Uh, uh, the fact that you can get total control and have, say, the bare minimum OS on ZFS, share it over NFS, and then booting in an instant, that's, that's very capable. And on that note, do you, do you have any other examples off the top of your head where you simply can't do that on Linux? That's actually a really good message. That is uh, maybe for a future time, uh, but... Um... I guess at this point, uh, I don't quite think so. Uh, yeah. Do you think about it, please, both of you. Just, I, I, it's somewhat, I think there's a big kind of global cross, you know, and crossroads where, uh, where let's just sort of keep things in perspective. Um, let's build that list. Cool. That is, and it's things like stating the obvious for some that are really helpful. It's really, really helpful because we all get lost in the weeds of all these technologies and like the nifty CTL back vert IO SCSI storage for VMs, which is hot pluggable, but doesn't yet have a fancy front end and blah, 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 blah. So thank you for that. That was refreshing. If if I may, sorry, I didn't want of to course. interrupt. No, it's your call. <laughs> I'm just a moderator. Uh, thanks, Jan. When you when you say boot from, so the container itself to boot from an, an attached volume, for example. Or... Uh, no, no. Is that uh, basically well? It's, in our use case, it's not total distance because we still have like say a five gigabyte or yeah. whatever default is on EC2, it just boot. But mm -hmm. it, it kind of like, uh, after, where after it boot in the LC script, uh, or, well, it's actually in the cloud init uh, script, what happened mm -hmm. is that it will mount the uh, NFS volume from the uh, NFS server and use it as a route to um, run its tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically within the container, it would just like uh, do all the transcoding and crazy things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so in that way, no, no matter how big we make the actual container, it, it kind of always just work with mm -hmm. like uh, everything inside. So uh, we don't really need to worry about... Uh, so I think it's easier for me to uh, give an example, right? So let's say if I'm doing it on Linux, uh, let's say I try to do exactly the same thing. I create a new Linux, let's say Ubuntu instance, that already have Docker inside, and then I, I try to like uh, run a container uh, with some arguments and with some volume mounts. If I'm going to do it on Linux, technically I have to worry about how big is my container because that Linux machine has to pull the container first because before you can use it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we don't make like the container already part of the this image is that uh, it allows us to upgrade. Uh, or like patch the contain much quicker without having to generate a new EC2 image every single time. But yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's like the context. But on the Linux side, we have to worry about how big is the image because if we, uh, this is only a, say, 
uh, 10 gigabits and let's say the things we include because we do include a lot of junks is mm-hmm. bigger than let's say 10 gig or 7 gig or whatever and then it kind of blows up the storage then mm-hmm. it doesn't work anymore right but on the FreeBSD side because the whole thing is NFS mount we don't actually have to care how big it is if that makes sense so yeah. mm-hmm. you, yep. you, you just mount the container well I mean you mount the NFS and then you run the jail on top of it yeah so you don't have to care how big it, it actually is mm-hmm. and you, you just allow it to do its job of course there's other things you need to run prior to actually run the container you also have mm-hmm. to like um uh uh did we use as did we use like the ec2 um fuse i forgot but you know things like that we kind of need to mount the fuse uh mm-hmm. for the s3 and then and then bind mount it well, or now, now mount it to uh, somewhere inside the container and things like that. We, we do have to do those kind of things, but the idea is that now mm-hmm. our base image that we use to bootstrap the entire process mm-hmm. can just stay the same for the entire lifetime of the company base. Well, not the company, but like for the, yeah. like the entire year, we don't have to change anything. And our container yeah. is already like, say, 56 revision or whatever. Yeah. And it just run because we don't have to care about it anymore, right? And we only yeah. ever need to keep one piece, like one image there, and mm-hmm. we just forget about it. And everything, the actual logic and what we need to run in this like dynamic creator computer is defined by the container, mm-hmm. like the set of S data set sitting on an NFS server. And we, yeah. if we need to upgrade it or like, you know, do all kinds of things, we do it on the server. But when we actually need to run them, we just use the same um, stream down minimal uh, FreeBSD, this image, and you know just yep. just create yep. a worker and then do all kind yep. of container stuff. Yeah, so it, it becomes really efficient. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree because that's why I, I wanted to ask because what you're describing is exactly, or let's not say exactly, to, to a great extent how, for example, ECS, AWS ECS works. Actually, that's exactly what mm-hmm. we're doing now. So, uh, but the example I'm, we're using, maybe it's a little bit different. For example, I w- we want to store the logs in, in the, uh, of course, you don't store it inside the, the container running. You need to store it somewhere. And yep. actually, I'm not, uh, by default in the, in, the, in the container ecosystem, maybe you may find different options or not at all. But with ECS, uh, at least you can have a lot of options like, uh, for example, NFS based volume that uh, that the container can run to, and you get mm-hmm. uh, sorry, not NFS, uh, EFS, Elastic File System. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, most of the AWS starts with the E as Elastic, yeah. or even uh, or even you can um, uh, what is it? Like they have some drivers that you can write the logs directly into uh, CloudWatch, for example. Uh, mm-hmm. CloudWatch is, is is like so, sort of agree, um, log aggregation and event log logs and events aggregation service from a, from AWS. So this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think what you're explaining is is there, but um, which actually draws us to another question. It would be interesting to know if some if for example if we make a an uh, because eventually you need to run the container. Forget now. Forget for now if it's a Linux container or a Beasley container or a Lumis container. You need to run the container on a machine. So that uh, specifically, mm-hmm. if you're gonna specify the resources yourself. So in the machine here is a virtual machine. In the case of mm-hmm. AWS ECS, they they have what they call uh, EC, uh, ECS optimized uh, uh, EC2 machines. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? That uh, it's a it's a it's a, uh, an EC2 image that comes with some sort of an agent that allows mm-hmm. basically ECS to control that as a resource to deploy or schedule your workload, containerized uh, workload. And actually, it's very simple. At least uh, at the level we're using it, the agent basically handles the the, the machine itself, but basically it delegates eventually the the um, the container related commands, let's say, to a Docker uh, engine that is running on the EC2 instance. Okay. So actually, 
it basically is like you're running Docker images manually in a sort, but it's automated. It would be interesting mm. to see if, for example, we, uh, I'm not sure how, how we, know, we know that because ECS for sure is not open source, as far as I'm aware, mm -hmm. if we have an, an, an ECS, uh, EC2 image optimized to run, uh, sorry, with ECS, but it runs, let's say, FreeBSD, not mm -hmm. Linux, and basically does the same with jails or zones mm. when it comes to Illumis. But but of course we also need to think how to like in the same way integrate like uh, if if you like uh, the example I mentioned how to attach volumes based on uh, ECS for uh, sorry if uh, EFS or how to do the things like exactly as they do with, mm -hmm. with the current setup that that basically will give you what you uh, what you were explaining. Yeah, that that's cool. Yeah, at that time we have to explore like the other options except like you know EC2 and S S3 because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes on the AWS side like uh, it, it can be pretty complex with all the products. Mm -hmm. So so we only explore with like the most basic EC2 and related stuff. And then best thing is that uh, we can kind of web, uh, we can kind of reproduce it, except the EC2 API part. Uh, we can kind of debug the whole thing, but mm -hmm. it is cool to know that something like that on AWS. And then, yeah. It, do we have a contact on the AWS or someone that we can ask if something Colin? like this was okay? I'd start there. Okay. He'd probably know. Okay. Um, welcome, Jan. We've been discussing, as you can see in the minutes. Um, I do have, in fact, a question Jan asked, but I wanted to say, hey, uh, Jan, can I call you a Jan K or Jan C? <laughs> to be different from Jan B. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, Jan Michael, uh, are you using the FreeBSD diskless infrastructure at all, which creates like a, a compressed root and then expands it for true NFS support with writable, fully writable file systems? Because NFS, not a file system, you might uh, encounter some surprises. Uh, me? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so yeah, everything we just, has we just worked. use like the pure EC2 NFS, no problem like at all. Image. Okay, cool. Yep. And then Jan B asked, are you using either uh, 9PFS or vert IO fuse for say the that type of mount or logging or others? And Jan, if I was accurate on your question, go ahead and rephrase it if I'm not. Anyway, does that make sense? Oh, uh, because we're on EC2, so we don't have access to the VMM and everything. So, okay. you know, we, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Do you then, happen to know uh, ahead. what we use for the out of band management communication channels? Are we using VetIO VSOC or uh, just a console device or, or a secondary Ethernet or um, Nick? What's the logging and so on? Or is it all done in band? Uh, this I have no idea. Uh... Actually, Vertalo VSOC is something I'm also interested in asking as well. Because I only learned about it a few days ago and it looks like something uh, Beehive definitely should uh, take and copy and run with. Uh, tell us more. I am finding a link for okay. it from the QVMU page, but yeah. Uh, uh, long story short, it's it's a new address family, just like IP or uh, I, so IPv4 or IPv6 or Unix sockets. Right now, the two supported socket types are stream and datagram, no sequential packet. And uh, the addresses work like this. The hypervisor has a well-known address. All addresses are just flat numbers, basically a reserved number for the host and one per guest. And then the uh, guests on the same host or the uh, hypervisor and the guest uh, can communicate and there's a 32 bit uh, port number space as well. And for example, there's uh, a patch set to patch the Linux, NFS, client, and server. 
so that you can do NFS without IP addresses over mm -hmm. uh, authenticated channels. So basically, you, the hypervisor, if it's the NFS server or proxy, knows that this source address is this guest and can trust this. So you don't need to set up a secondary vid.io net interface and make sure all your guest images know how to bring it up and down. And it's a socket interface. So everything which can basically be run through a TCP or UDP proxy or uh, through uh, INAD or something and just works over standard IO, it just works out of the box. So basically all you need is if it's a service supposed to be running in the guest and it can run over INAD and doesn't use any special system calls for half closing sockets or something, it will just work. And you and said would... NFS without IPs, is that accurate? Yes. Wow. Uh, you, uh, they had to extend the export uh, format a bit so that uh, the wildcard still only matches IP addresses. And so the, you just prefix it with VSOC uh, colon. Then it's uh, basically guest or, or host ID dot uh, port number of the address format. So it's just two numbers uh, with no structure inside of them. And the host has a well-known address so that well-known ports of the host are always reachable without configuration. And it's supposed to be quite fast. So uh, tens of gigabits uh, at least. Uh, and that's why it would be interesting because one of the truly uh, a bit crazy ideas uh, which came to mind is that you could use these uh, stream connections basically as a TCP offloading engine in the guest, as a VTR device which just uses this channel to uh, act as a stream proxy for a very active long-lived TCP connection. And then the host can make use of its uh, offloading engines and, and deal with a stream instead of a, a collection of packets and a ring buffer. And yeah, but the near-term use cases that basically you can proxy almost anything over it. You could extend INAT to support it. And then the guest could just, you could have something like a etc rise file where if exists, dot, 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 dot. And you could even chip release images, which if there's a VSOC device, they open up default services or something to the hypervisor only. So that it would just work out of a box. Interesting. And the really interesting part about this is because it's basically stream on and datagram sockets over a trusted channel. Um, you do, no longer need a new VIRT-IO device host and guest driver for each new feature you want to add, like uh, XORG or something. If you want to run X11 over it, why not? Hmm. Uh, you could, can have a uh, spice already supports it. So that uh, you can have a spice server running on the guest and you don't need to add a new bit IO device class. Instead, you can just do it in user space on both ends. Well, so you don't have to change a weekend project. <laughs> That's very yeah, um, cool. it's, it's a neat idea. Uh, uh, definitely worth uh, taking because you can use it. For example, you could use it to enable uh, SSH access to the guest always. So basically the SSH daemon would always try to listen uh, to this address and uh, allow via match class then the host to connect to it. And the guests would uh, be available. And even if you uh, break all your network configuration, your normal one, you would have an out of band SSH server which gets terminated inside the guest. So, no need to basically decrypt your console uh, in the hypervisor and use a plain text channel into the guest. Hmm. Uh, the serial port or something, the emulated serial port. So, that's uh, why it would be quite useful. Or, for example, for log shipping, just have your just forward the DMESC output completely 
and it would always be recorded and you don't have a problem that, oh, it was written to the serial console, but no one was listening. Mm -hmm. Right. These kinds right. of things. Uh, lots of operational use cases for it. And while in theory, you could do almost anything you can do with it over just TCP and UDP over a second vid.io net interface, then you always have to make sure that you take care of all the um, management inside the guest and in your hypervisors. So it's a, two, basically it's a lot harder to set up the tooling and there's more overhead. Interesting. But yeah, that's uh, why I was asking because something like logging for a so-called serverless function would be a very good use case for something like this. Just write your standard out to one socket and your standard error to another one mm -hmm. and capture it on the hypervisor and make it available, have the hypervisor timestamp it and so on. Yes, please. So, but the idea of making other storage protocols like S3 available over it would also be interesting. Not just file storage, but object storage and so on. And you could always trust that you're talking to the kernel of the guest. So you get similar to our uh, Unix domain sockets can trust the kernel to authenticate it. Someone talking through the trusted hypervisor to a guest could trust the uh, forwarded connection to be authenticated by the hypervisor as yes, is it this tenant's virtual machine requesting this uh, connection? No need to deploy client certificates or something. Interesting. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, Jan, you missed a poll I had that's probably a long running discussion of why aren't you using Linux and what can't be done on Linux? Do you have anything to add to the list? I don't know if you're watching along. I don't know what I have to add to the list, but what you don't have to do, you don't have to fight the um, image system war. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't. Uh, so basically, or basically uh, accept unconditional surrender on your part. <laughs> and then uh, you have D-Trace and ZFS properly integrated into the releases. Yeah. While these days eBPF can do, also BPF trace can do a lot of nifty things and some even, which at least FreeBSD D-Trace may not support out of the box, especially destructive uh, features as a service, but um, then just that I can trust that ZFS is always there for me. Yep. And not that the next kernel release, like just a few weeks ago, will break the kernel API in a way that OpenZFS now has to fix because of all the file system namespacing API in the kernel has been completely rearranged. Was there another situation or some time ago? So a few weeks ago, uh, maybe a month or two ago. By now. Oh, no kidding. I missed that one. Uh, yeah, so um, of course you can still use long time uh, release uh, branches. So right. if you learn, and it, they will definitely fix it before uh, those go end of life. So there are ways, unless sure, you sure, need sure. the latest hardware drivers and don't want to cherry pick them. Yep. Then uh, there's the, well, some Linux distributions, but not the common ones have uh, something comparable to the ports tree. So what makes the ports tree different from other Linux distributions packet uh, systems for me is that it embraces uh, building it yourself if you need to. While we could do a lot to improve the multi-repository usage with only a few ports added and so on, but at least you can do it. And you can even take the existing ports and maintainers are somewhat uh, expected to um, make sure the build options they offer actually work instead of you having to patch every uh, build instruction for your distribution if you need some uncommon 
database or you want to make sure you're using only Postgres, uh, even if MySQL is the default for this application, stuff like this. Sure. Um, to be honest, by now, I really, I'm used to the user land and the tools available in the flag. So the part where it's easy for FreeBSD users to trust that the user land won't crumble away underneath them so that you have the stable release base system and then the either quarterly or uh, a rolling release uh, ports on top of that. Yep. Which is quite nice. And how easy it is to uh, consume FreeBSD and basically take control over your product and just basically uh, ship it as your own distribution. Build your yep. own custom FreeBSD derived product. Not that I'm doing it, but I know of people doing it. Sure. And suppose, and it's a lot harder with most Linux distributions. Yeah, you know, these kinds of things then. Nicely put. And I think, you know, one, we're often preaching with the converted. Two, mm -hmm. we lose track of like what brought us here and mm -hmm. why we do what we do we and have, seeing uh, the forest from the trees. I quite prefer jails over the common way of deploying Linux uh, containers, whatever your definition of container on Linux is, because Linux itself doesn't have one. <laughs> um, yes. Great, thank you. That's and you've 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 echoed quite a few things from Mohammed and Michael. The other yawn, the other Michael. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, I, Jan, would you have, I see you joined at 10 a.m. Pacific. Do you have any objections to that time slot? I'm thinking to move the calls, the Beehive calls at that time. Just an hour uh, uh, later? Later, which you happen to follow today. Yeah, today that worked for me uh, because. <laughs> Great. So no, I don't have any objections. Um, that's uh, most of the time, that's 7 p.m. local time, which works. Oh, well. not so bad. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, we've covered quite a lot of ground in the last hour and 20 minutes. Any other thoughts, questions, ideas, things that occurred to you? Or shall we push this to next week? And I think so far, so good, except. Um... For the VSOC, I want to add is actually we, we actually have the VSOC ish client, but it's for the Hyper V VSOC. Uh, in client wise, saying we don't have like native like word title VSOC interface for either server, uh, well, host or client yet. Uh, but the our cousin, uh, our cousin, uh, XNU, the Apple side, seems to have a uh, VSOC support already. So maybe that's something we can look at. But I'm not sure if the um, Mac OS one support like uh, we saw in both host and like client mode. So uh, Mina is uh, working on that as well for uh, the cloud edit support it, for FreeBSD on VSOC mm -hmm. support, but I don't know how far along he is. Um, But it really should be one of the easier VIT.io devices to implement because it's really fairly simple yeah. concept. Yeah, but does uh, cloud you need support uh, doing over VIT.io VSOC? Because if it, it yes, is, it supposedly, be awesome. uh, or, or it does it, uh, so LXD uses uh, it as well in some way, I think. Mm -hmm. That's for they're using this for the regression testing and stuff. So uh, you had to- Yeah, because that's much better. Problem. Yeah, because that's much better than the other cloud new method, for example, like pinning a special link local address uh, to HTTP against it. Yeah, that that's is a bit... what I would recommend these days because it just works. Have a secondary ethernet, enable IPv6 uh, link local only on it. 
Mm -hmm. and then have a well-known IPv6 address, uh, a link local IPv6 address, connect to it and fetch your initial configuration there, which works really well with uh, uh, FreeBSD, um, what is it called by Colin Percival, this little script uh, as part of the EC2, is it cloud config, I think? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that, that, that. Uh, actually use the well-known uh, IPv4 address to get the- Yeah, but uh, it works- High on the screen. Yeah, EC2 script is the odd for it. Yeah. And- Yeah, I'm it, just thinking about the highest perspective. Really... <laughs> yeah. So yeah. The really neat thing about his cloud in it is that it basically, it looks at the file, if it starts with a bang, it gets executed, if it starts with a, uh, redirect to a file it gets written to it. If it starts with an append, it gets appended. And otherwise it tries to untry it to, to a temporary directory and does it recursively. So you can just chip a tarball of uh, append and uh, set and execute files uh, as a single HTTP resource or whatever, because it just reads mm -hmm. it from standard in if you want. So it already should work. I don't know if his rc.d script does it, but the script itself will work. Hmm. And it's a tiny little shell script. Jan, are you by chance tearing open OCI images on ZFS? No, uh, because I don't have that use case. Okay. Why? Uh, because uh, Michael, uh, pointed out that overlay FS is one of the few things that's holding him back on his deployments. And that's come um, up on a few calls, but. So it's more jail focused than beehive focused, but I can repeat for him what I have done with ZFS on FreeBSD to get overlays without uh, overlays basically. So breaking, using the ZFS feature set to get everything I wanted of overlays without falling into the trap of uh, cl cloning writable file systems or uh, requiring null FS and, or even worse union FS because that's really the fragile one. Yeah, I'm able to like do the uh, ZFS one, I but ideally I want to be able to run on a system without ZFS. Mm -hmm. So that's why, uh, that's other thing that using set of S actually does not so, really solve. Uh, there is like one the thing uh, like. for small VMs, which is interesting in FreeBSD 14, there will be a new JLM uh, class written by Kirk mm -hmm. uh, to have a block level union file system. Uh, sorry, block level union. Right. I, I think, uh, Michael, you were in the room for his presentation, right? From the, uh, what I've seen in the code, the problem is that really you have an underlay and an overlay. And right now you can only basically flush the changes tracked in the overlay, which can be a thin provision uh, geom as well, because uh, there's a virtualized block storage uh, geom class. So you could have a big uh, read-only device, or at least most of the time read-only device, then the overlay and write this to a file and then just have it basically a thin provision geom as uh, overlay, use it and then flush it back. But the problem is that you can't really preserve the overlay right now. He says that it should be possible, but not yet, it's probably not for release. So you, the only way of preserving the changes in the overlay is by allowing uh, it to flush to the underlay, which kind of defeats some of the purposes. But if you only have to ha uh, have a writable file system on an otherwise unfair system, so something like your var run and so on, or just ill-behaved software, which demands uh, that it is able to write to some virtual and Python uh, directory or something, in that case, uh, you're covered. Mm 
but mm -hmm. if you really, yeah. The other thing which, uh, if your images are so small that you, and your virtual machines that you really you have to use uh, UFS, you're, I would say implicitly also limited to images so small uh, on hardware with relatively as much bandwidth so that you get back into the uh, comfortable range of the storage uh, to bandwidth ratio that you can do a lot of other clever things. For example, you could have just uh, used something like Rastic to store UFS uh, dumps. So why did level zero dump to uh, compress deduplicated uh, backups service like Rastic and just have your boot code restore that, but runs at more than gigabit ethernet. So yeah, that's also an option. Is that helpful? I think so. Uh, but I think the the one current work on is work on block level. So it's not necessarily like useful in the case of OCI images because no, those are all object level. Right? They're file level, right? Mm -hmm. Not object level. Yeah, right? the, they're object. Like the OCI tile images are quite literally just uh, file system layers, so. But uh, they are tables uh, of tables, right? No, they're just tables. So it's a flat, it's one level of tar or is there a, a, it's a only tar one level in a tar? tar? Okay. No, it's just a tar, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's the direct restructure inside a tar. Yes, and then, well, actually that is how it's distributed, but, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think the usual, I'm not entirely sure if what I'm saying is true, but the usual way is that you just unarchive them and they're in a certain directory and then okay. uh, on so the next side, they just union months them together. If, if you're on the other extreme and are willing to commit to only using UFS, uh, UFS has something which ZFS and almost any other file system lack, and that is proper on disk support for write out files. So ZFS just doesn't have a file type on disk for it, but UFS does. So in theory, you can uh, mount multiple UFS file systems on the same mount points without going for union FS and have uh, basically search each other in the mount order. I you mean like really union, used... union, mounting, union, uh... union mounting UFS file systems without using the union FS. Okay. Hmm. Um, I have. Uh, it should work. I've never had a use case for it because I don't want to give up ZFS. <laughs> Instead of what I did find out, which is really useful for some things, is that in FreeBSD you have tempfs, but the problem with the tempfs is that it starts out empty, right? Mm -hmm. But if you use the MFS. Uh, File system type in FS type, it goes, it doesn't, get, it doesn't go directly through the kernel mounting of tempfs, but goes through the mount MFS command, which can then create the empty uh, tempfs with the correct permission size and so other limits, and use uh, packs to copy a directory and restore it as uh, precise as packs is capable of into the tempfs. So that as part of mounting, so it, it gets uh, pre-filled, which is very useful for things like, yeah, Valvan or, or slash etc. If you want to have a, and that's how I used it to mount a slash etc um, as a tempfs, but have it pre-filled and then on shutdown, I will just uh, preserve it or after updates, because it's just kilobytes or a few megabytes at worst. Mm -hmm. Unless you want, you have ZFS available, then you have better options of just taking basically these tiny stateful data sets and doing a deep uh, copy instead of a clone. So mm -hmm. just send and receive them locally, a snapshot, Send and receive a snapshot, you get a 
complete duplication of that, but for some things like USR local ETC and slash ETC, it's harmless. And it's all state, so there's no benefit. If you accept that this is mutable state, then you have to manage it. And no amount of file system trickery can help you there because you would basically need a patch level overlay. So a version control system, <laughs> not a file system. Mm -hmm. Which is of course also an option of it's just having a, creating an empty tempfs and cloning a Git repository into it, or a certain branch of a Git repository, or a certain tag, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that all of these are technical options available to FreeBS users, but none of them are the common way of doing it, and you always have to reinvent the whole ecosystem if you do this. While OCI is the given format, and the best thing you can do and remain compatible according to my uh, superficial understanding of it is you would have to basically unpack the tarball into a data set and then apply their whiteout files and basically uh, materialize the overlay. Mm -hmm. And while this can be quite fast for small file system, it's not as elegant and yeah, there are other reasons like this is yeah, this technically works, but unfortunately, oh, unfortunately the OCI is in bad. The white alpha is is horribly designed. Hmm. So it's just yeah, the it naming terrible. convention, right? No, it's it's not just that. So with a hmm. white alpha, you can say, okay, whenever I encounter like the naming convention of this file, I create a white alpha, right? That's simple, correct? Mm -hmm. But there's an other kind of OCI whiteout files that's supposed to white out the entire lower, lower directory. Mm -hmm. So they yes. do have recursive whiteout support. So okay. the, the whiteout, well, if the whiteout file is named dot wh dot dot wh dot opq, it's supposed to white out the entire directory of the mm -hmm. lower uh, directory. So, so without- You can do that so, during materializing oh, finish. it. Hold on. Yes, yeah, so so technically we can, so unless we already know what is the lower layer, we cannot create like all the YL files that we're supposed to create. So okay. unless there's an other option to that, but the thing is that, okay, the idea is that, okay, so in that case, we don't have to do union map, right? You can just mount it over. Well, it, it does not work because like this YL files that wipe out the entire directory can be, mm -hmm in one of the arbitrary subdirectories as well. So that makes the uh, entire thing extremely hard to deal with without a dedicated file system. So one of the things the more complicated jail managers used to do, and sometimes some even still do it, is to replace basically the whole default file system structure with symlinks into a hidden directory at the root level then you just have nullfs file systems and you materialize the directories up to the point or of uh, your divergence and mm -hmm. put it in there and then you have only have to manage a lot of some links and as long as the directory structure is remains intact uh, you can do that and quickly change nullfs mount points in there, um, that this should all, there's no reason why you can't do this uh, outside of a jail to the host system. If you're careful that you always have your base tools available, you could install like that, even on bare metal, no need for a hypervisor. And if you do it like that, yeah, it's a bit annoying to manage, but of course you can automate it. And you would basically have to run some kind of analysis on image support to find the points where you have to have a directory in the basically glue file system containing the right sim links. And but you get a problem if you have to support basically merging directories so that unexpected new files in them show up. So there are limitations there. They are not that relevant for package management. But they can be relevant if you uh, 
have badly written software to support or just really no regard for this. Mm -hmm. Noted. Well, we are at an hour and a half, and I think we've covered some really good ground. And there is one thing you may be able to do, I just not, which is a bit, um, maybe in same, you may be able to uh, put the use, uh, use an auto uh, FS as the hidden directory. You said auto FS? It, yes, auto FS to have a dynamic map. And if it's a host, so in charge of mounting, it could have the auto FS, the on demand materialize uh, the dynamic part. Mm -hmm. And you would have, that would be a bit, I assume it would work, but it would be annoying to debug until mm -hmm. you have the tooling uh, in place. <laughs> Hmm. But because you couldn't, but having some basically, uh, so the auto FS with auto Monty can have dynamic maps, which get then executed and write out the map on demand. It's normally used, for example, to retrieve the list of NFS shares available via LDAP or something. But you can also do it to dynamically create the overlays on demand. Basically, tell your storage backend that I need this overlay materialized, and when it is materialized, and either content addressed or using a specific naming scheme to solve this, uh, deduplicated. Noted. Well, may I propose we wrap it up here and carry these discussions forward? Oh. I I think it's come up periodically, like what would a native ZFS whiteout or overlay look like? And uh, Jan, if you have a moment, there are two reviews to take a peek at that were very timely from yesterday's call. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, yep. Um, so ADI fallback, I don't know about that. Uh, take a look at your leisure. Okay, uh, okay that's uh, nice to have. So the idea is that you can have a jail for the first one with the ABI brand. It allows you to have a jail which has a different default ABI so that you don't have to brand the executables inside it as Linux and you don't have to change the default ABI of the host to Linux uh, to support running unbranded uh, Linux executables in a jail, which, okay, nice, uh, but only relevant to this use case and Having route and net start to be able to J attach, yeah, that's also useful. One of the nice things is that it, uh, if you use it like that, uh, uh, it doesn't matter to uh, if you're running an old uh, user land, so you could be running some kind of statically linked FreeBSD4 or something in there, uh, or uh, um, a Linux uh, jail, which doesn't have to learn about IF config and so on. But given that FreeBSD 13.2 and newer uh, have Netlink support, it may be that a lot of Linux specific networking tools just work for the basic stuff you need in a jail for Freenet. So that IP2 and the likes just work. At least for adding inter routes and local addresses to existing interfaces. Mm -hmm. because, oh. the patch, because the patch set to BERT2 is quite small. So we didn't have to re-implement it all. It just so yeah, a few more corner cases to the existing netlink, and it supports quite uh, complicated routing. Stuff, nothing you would normally expect to run in a VNet enabled Linux chain. Sure. So, uh... Michael, go ahead and tag Jamie on the one and tickle him on the other, or at least tickle the review so it shows up in his inbox. Uh, um, hopefully mm -hmm. those can make it into 14. That would be awesome. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to uh, change the things that I sent the uh, 
Mm-hmm. suggest first and then before actually tagging Jamie what? so there's like less notification flying around um, and I think for uh, the API brand thing I just need someone else to kind of move it a little bit and then see if we're able to just find someone mm-hmm. to commit it to 14. Okay so uh, the route patch is really nice and small but uh, there's a valid a recommendation of basically doing the translation from jail name to jail ID uh, at the point of J attach instead of doing the parsing. So yeah, that's a valid concern that the uh, get up uh, loop shouldn't do the jail lookup and jail attach. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, moving it directly after the option parsing would be a good idea. Oh yeah, I've worked, I've worked on that already. Yeah. Yeah, but that only adds a few more lines. Mm-hmm. On that note, I would love to call it at ten forty-five Pacific. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you all for joining, and it's been a remarkably good discussion with just a handful of people. And I will see some of you next Wednesday, perhaps, for the jail call, the proper jail call, despite the fact that we covered a lot of jail topics today. Well, everyone, have a fantastic weekend. And you know where to find me. I'll be around a few minutes. Regarding uh, all kinds, uh, all uh, sorts of includes, uh, not just jail specific things. A lot of tools have uh, basically uh, yak parsers in base, which is fine. And they just read uh, using the standard uh, C uh, file API and read the uh, std in file handle. So the idea I came up with of just uh, using uh, unopen, where you have a set of callbacks to respond to the op. Uh, operations you can do on a file handle and a pointer to your state uh, is totally viable so that you can have a, a, the, an interposer which does the uh, configuration include handling transparent to the uh, Lexa and uh, parser. Right, because and that was the executable it, config file? No, no, that's, that's, that a config no, file that's or the idea of, uh, this is the idea of how you could uh, basically do uh, include handling uh, outside of the normal Lexa because the Lexa wouldn't even see it. The include directives would just be replaced with the included file content in the input stream. So for example, the jail command, just uh, make sure that the configuration file is its standard in uh, file handle. Uh, the one is provided at just if it's not the standard in part, it opens it and assigns it to the standard in handle. Cool. And then, which is nice because you can also use all of these callback based hacks through it. So you could have, uh, what I was looking into is writing a small helper function uh, called slurp, which would just read all of this into a memfd. So that even for pickier tools, then the J command, uh, you would have a memfd containing it all. And because memfds, support your normal read position and read write system calls in addition to memory mapping. You could have it as soon, as long as it's not too big to load into memory, you could just, first of all, I wanted to just add support for slurping in an, a list of files. Yep. But the next step would be to do uh, some kind of include detection and rewrite the include directives with the content of the included files. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is that uh, popen would also be uh, just uh, basically you could have a trivial wrapper around popen to do this uh, and have it read and write from the uh, pipes uh, because the seek uh, can just be no sorry uh, we oh. can't seek which also works because uh, that's just how it is if you read from a pipe or socket or tty or something. Yeah, so uh, that already works. Uh, okay. We look forward to your demo or proof of concept. Okay. Sure. Cool. Uh, yeah. I'm going to call it.
Thank you, everyone. Take care and have a good weekend. You too, sir. Bye.